We have a brand new MCU film in theaters this week, and that is the Marvels. And with that said, when we get a new MCU film, that means it's time to re-rank the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe from worst to best. This is going to be a fun list, guys. I can't wait to dive into this because my ranking has shifted quite a bit, and some of it you won't like, some of it you definitely won't agree with, and some of it you might be like, that's an interesting choice. But that's where I want to hear your guys' thoughts and your ranking down below in the comment section. So make sure to leave those down there. Hit that like subscribe button for more movie content like this because we also will be ranking all the MCU shows with the conclusion of Loki Season 2 later this weekend as well. So if you're watching this now, tune into that as well because Loki's finale was incredible. And at the end of this year, once What If Season 2 comes out, I'm going to do a ranking of all the movies and shows all together. So with that said, let's dive in to this MCU movie ranking. Coming out at number 33 is Thor The Dark World. Once again, this remains at the bottom. It's just not a movie that I care to watch. When I do these rankings, it always comes down to rewatchability, how I feel in the film, do I ever care to go back to it? Specifically over the last year and a half, I've actually gotten a little bit more into the Thor comics. I was never into that more. And actually reading about the Dark Elves and their storylines, it actually frustrates me even a little bit more that Thor The Dark World is this dull and boring because the Dark Elves are some of the most unique aspects of Thor's world. I think Thor The Dark World still has successes in Thor and Loki's storyline, but this is overall just a complete and utterly dull mess. My number 32 is the first Captain Marvel, another movie that I think really loses itself with having almost no personality. And that's wild to say because I know a lot of people don't Love Brie Larson, but I think she's an exceptional actress, and I think her coming in as Captain Marvel, I was very excited because she can have that charm, that personality, and she doesn't have this of that. And a lot of that is just mainly because of how they decided to write Captain Marvel into this movie. It's not great, and I think it actually does her no service whatsoever. So there's some fun action, and I think everything that takes place on Earth between Captain Marvel and Nick Fury are easily the best parts about the movie because of their dynamic, because of their chemistry, and just because we get more of Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury. The scrolls are an intriguing aspect that I was happy to see finally come into the MCU, but again, this is a movie that I don't care to rewatch. It's a movie that I find that has zero personality, and it's overall a film that just seems to have missed the mark to what brings greatness to the MCU. On my number 31, we have Iron Man 2. Now, this one really much is still a fun and entertaining movie, but it is a messy movie that has the premise of giving us an Iron Man sequel, but as well as developing everything with the Avengers. Usually there's always one film in the MCU within each phase that really much has that issue with exposition trying to give in and further out the MCU in a different light, and Iron Man 2 is one of those movies that just falters a little bit from it. Now, I still think, again, like it's fun. Whiplash is wasted as a villain, but I do think Sam Rockwell's Justin Hammer is great, and I think it's kind of a disservice that we haven't gotten more of him in the MCU yet. Specifically, of because of how big Sam Rockwell has gotten over the last couple of years from his Oscar Academy and awards. So for me, when I watch Iron Man 2 again, it's enjoyable. I can smile because it's Downey playing Tony Stark. He's great. I think Don Cheadle is awesome as War Machine. And again, that action scene when they're like back to back, exceptional. I love it. I just... Again, don't really care to rewatch this one all too often. We get over to my number 30, which this is actually the only MCU movie I have never bought first day on Blu-ray. That is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, a film that I walked out and I had a lot of complicated feelings on because half the movie I loved and thought had great ideas and the other half, the more I think about it, the worse it gets. And this comes from someone who has liked the other two Ant-Man movies, the, specifically the first one a lot. And I liked the idea that Ant-Man would be getting this giant blockbuster of a movie and the fact that he had to discover Kang and go up against this version of Kang. And everything with Kang the Conqueror is exceptional. It's the best part about the movie. Everything that you see with Jonathan Majors is performed excellently well. I loved seeing Kang take on every single one and just get frustrated and seeing how much he has built up to here. And I think they did a good job of building him up as a villain up until the end. Because now the meme with many of the general going audience is that Kang was defeated by ants. 
And the other thing is, and I feel like this is where it really does it hold a service to the entire film, is actually the ending of this movie. The ending of this movie ruins everything for what they set up with Kang. The fact that you have Ant-Man come back. So you have no stakes that no one died, no one was lost. Where in reality, Ant-Man or the Wasp or both of them should have absolutely stayed in the quantum realm. And everyone else should have gotten out. And then that could have added Cassie to have to form the Young Avengers or, I don't know, something of that nature, the next team of Avengers. Okay, you don't want to do that? Fine. But who brought Ant-Man into the world of the MCU, the greater overall of it? Falcon. And who is Falcon now? He's Captain America. And what's a great joke in Civil War? When freaking Scott Lang keeps shaking Captain America's hand because he's a big fan. Well, now his friend, sort of friend, is now Captain America. So you could have easily ended the film with Scott Lang going and talking to Captain America, telling him there is this greater overall threat that could potentially come back. There's multiple versions of him. I don't know how they could bring it out. Maybe those multiple versions came in and killed Kang the Conqueror, that version. And then we all know about them and then, you know, we didn't even need the end credit scene. There's so many different ideas of how they could have done this. It was frustrating to me. I thought MODOK was fun. But overall, the film was just a mess. The CGI is a mess. It's one that I can enjoy for half the film, but the rest of it, I just don't care for. Number 29, we have Thor. Now, this is a movie I've always, every time I go back to watch it, I want to love it more because I think Kenneth Branagh is a really good director. But then I watch it and I'm like, that was solid. It's a good outing. And I think that's exactly how Thor is. I think it's a good development piece to overall him as a character and when you watch everything within the Infinity Saga. But then when you actually kind of think back, you kind of forget a lot of the moments. And the best stuff is all the elements on Asgard. And then you take him to Earth. And I understand the poetic and very much Shakespearean tale that we're trying to tell here. But that's not what I cared for. What I cared for was everything on Asgard with Thor, Loki, and Odin. And all of those elements and how they really much were dynamicing this entire family element. Other than that... Thor's a good movie, just not one that I really care for all too much. Number 28 is The Incredible Hulk. Now, this is kind of like the ugly stepchild that no one really talks about in the MCU, but we all talk about that abomination Incredible Hulk fight scene because it is incredible, to say the least. Uh, I love that sequence. For me, this is just kind of one of those bears that Edward Norton didn't continue being the Hulk. The tone of this movie was not the tone that they went for. They had a tone in Iron Man, they had a tone in this, and all the general going audience really much liked the Iron Man tone, and they didn't really flock to this tone. So they ended up shifting, and that's the tone that they went with. And Incredible Hulk is not a bad movie. It's a fun one. It's an engaging one. It's one that's very unique, and I think does a great job of a personal story to the Incredible Hulk and Mark or and Bruce Banner as a character. I think for me, there are a lot of forgettable elements, but it is one that every time I go back to watch, I'm like, this was quite underrated, and I think more people should give it a chance. Now we get into my number 27, which is Ant-Man and the Wasp, and this one is just a breezy, light movie that doesn't have the deepest story, nor is it a messy film. It's just one that makes you laugh, makes you smile, and you enjoy it for exactly what it is. And I thought the Wasp, the integration of it into the story, was probably the best part about it all. I think a lot of the shrinking and growing elements that they added added into here was a lot of fun as well this is just again another film that doesn't have any big stakes or big depth into the mcu or even its characters but it is one that it feels like a nice palate cleanser after everything that we saw and right before endgame my number 26 is captain america the first avenger which is a frustrating one because i think this is an excellent movie until the back half and i say the back half is because they montage through a lot of this it feels like there was an, a lot of added depth that should have been in there whether it was more scenes between are Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter, and I feel like that could have fleshed out that relationship a little bit more, or even more scenes between him and his best friend, Bucky. And for me, those are two relationships that are significant for the future of the MCU, whether it's the ending of Steve Rogers or specifically the Winter Soldier and what they bring in with Bucky. And I understand they kind of had to make a choice on which one was more important because, and they went more with the Bucky side, but Peggy Carter, for me, they did such a big thing of saying these two need to end up together. And the way that they tried bringing it about just didn't personally work for me all the way. So I like Captain Mary the First Avenger. It's a lot of fun, but it is montage -y, and I think they could have gone a little bit farther with it. On my number 25, this is probably the most controversial pick on here because I know a lot of you guys have this in your top 10. This is a movie that just has not worked for me, and that is Thor 
Ragnarok. I want to love this movie so much, specifically because I do love Taika Waititi as a director. This is just a film that the more and more I've watched it, the more and more frustrated I get by it. And a lot of that goes down to that the film, I feel, is one of the darkest stories in Thor's storyline. But we don't get that. We get fun and entertainment, and that's completely good, but it feels a lot like improv for almost the entire film, it's considering that every time we have a dark moment happen, like Hela, for instance, is one of the scariest villains, and I don't think they really gave Kate Blanchett too much to do in here, but then it's, it's broken up by a joke. And I know a lot of those people, same people have a lot of complaints with Thor Love and Thunder, and we'll talk about that, clearly it's higher up on my list, but the story they tried doing here just didn't work for me on a thematical level, but I will say it, it's higher up than most films on here because I do still think it's enjoyable. I love the Hulk and Thor fight scene. I love the Thor and Loki dynamic. I like how they all have to work together. And I think Valkyrie Tessa Thompson, I think this is like one of the best introductions to a side character in the MCU. And I hope to God we get more of just Tessa Thompson as Valkyrie. I think this introduction was badass. I like the Revengers type of thing that they created. This is just a fun movie. That, that's about it. That's exactly what I found from it, and a lot more people have this higher, and that's okay. Uh, rounding out into my number 24 is the brand new The Marvels. Now, this is a movie that I, the more I think about it, the more I enjoy it for its fun and light and breeziness, but there are significant problems with the story, and I address this all in my review. I still think the movie's a good movie, but it's not a great movie, and it's definitely not a great story either. There seems to be a lot missing here, and to just kind of like reiterate and talk about my issues first before I really talk about the greatness of this film and what I really liked is it's an hour and 45 minutes, and it definitely feels like it should have been 20 to 25. Some of that is the fact that Captain Marvel, like, there's a whole segment where it like gives exposition to other scenes, and there's a part with Captain Marvel that I swore was in the first Captain Marvel movie. It's like a deja vu type thing, and it wasn't. And it feels like maybe that should have been the ending of that Captain Marvel movie to then lead us into this, or maybe a Captain Marvel sequel in its own, and it never was. And so now they're trying to catch you up on that, so you're a little bit confused on elements like that. And I wasn't, you know, I've watched Miss Marvel and I've watched WandaVision, so I wasn't totally confused on, like, their stuff. But there's a couple moments where just characters jump in or there's characters talking and you feel like the conversation is going to be a little bit greater than it is. And it ends up just feeling like the ending of the conversation, like a lot of stuff was cut out there. And for me, that's where I go as far as say feels like 15 to 25 minutes was missing from the film. Whether it's Dep to Darben, the villain of this, who is absolutely one-dimensional and awful, or even to, again, its own characters, who I think have wonderful and great chemistry, and that's the reason that their dynamic works. But there's some heavy conversations that I feel like should have been had between all three of them, and you don't get that. So, I don't know the reasonings. Uh, apparently there were some reshoots on this movie and there are some really weird sequences too. one including these cats and another thing including singing. I wasn't a huge fan of either of those, but pushing my issues away, the film is still a lot of fun. It's a fun team up movie. It reminds me of like when I'd go down like the comic book aisle and I'd find a comic book cover with i don't know like just throwing out like ghost rider doctor strange and blade i'd be like that's an awesome thing that would be kind of me for me i'd go through and be like i love these three heroes they're not some of my favorites but i'm gonna buy this and it'll probably be a fun comic and it absolutely is because that's what this is it's a fun team-up movie there's no depth to it there's no which there should be but there's no depth it's just fun and I think Iman as Kamala Khan is still just like one of the biggest saving graces of the last two phases of the MCU. I think she is so perfect as Kamala Khan. And I think her charm, her cuteness, her excellency as this character and her excitement to be this character is the thing that I think really infuses this film with so much love and passion. And is she, as excited as her character is to be there, you can tell that Iman is also very excited. And the same thing goes for Brie Larson as Captain Marvel. I've been very critical of her, and I've said it in my when I talked about Captain Marvel. I'm not a big fan of Brie 
as Brie Larson as Captain Marvel before. I like her in the role, but it just seems so wooden. This finally gives her a little bit more service to do with the character, and this seems like the Captain Marvel in the direction that I wanted to see the character go. And of course, Monica Rambeau, I think this is just a great introduction to her. And to kind of talk a little bit about a spoiler, so if you haven't watched the Marvels yet, you got five, four, three, two, one. The end credit scene with Beast is excellent. I thought that was great and a great way to segue us in a little bit more into this multiverse saga, as you can see on my hat. So I thought that worked too. This is just overall, again, fun. And I also, shout out to Nia DaCosta. I thought she did an excellent job with all the action sequences in here. They were really creative and very unique. And just like from that opening one to the very last one, there's just a lot of fun to be had in that. So I enjoyed the Marvels for what it is. Maybe the next time you watch my ranking, it could be lower. But who knows? Down to my number 23, and that's Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, a film that I'm still pretty complicated on and pretty frustrated by at times, specifically because of its premise and very much this lacking nature of character development at times, but it's a damn great fun film, and I love Sam Raimi for that, exactly. I think Doctor Strange had the pivot of doing a lot. Now, getting my issues out of the way, I hate the two, I hate the ending, and I hate the two end credit scenes. Mostly more of just the end credit scene, because I think they neglect the ending of it all. On top of it, when they go to the other Earth, and I understand it's Multiverse of Madness, so I would expect, but I've, I've gotten over that complaint now because it's been, what, a year and a half. My complaint is when they go there, they get, uh, there's a part where Christine Palmer and Doctor Strange get sent to this other one, this, like, darker world, and which we get the excellent musical fight scene in there. In there, though, it feels like more shit was cut out. That seems like the development part for Christine Palmer and, of course, Doctor Strange. And... It's lacking and it's missing and that's my biggest criticism of it all and I think the film could have taken a little bit more of its time and some of the choices that they make with Wanda uh, now looking back are a little bit weaker than I thought initially so put those to the side now the film is a blast I think Elizabeth Olsen is so freaking good as the Scarlet Witch I think she kills it in this role I think Benedict Cumberbatch is excellent as Doctor Strange as I've said before I love 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 what Sam Raimi was able to do with this really infusing those horror tones into here the entire Illuminati murder fest is awesome I think including the Illuminati in here were great I wish they would have put up a little bit better of a fight but this is just one that I smile and delight when I watch now as big and as frustrating as I can get with certain elements, I think Multiverse of Madness does execute a lot of great stuff, but that's about it. It's a blast to watch. I just wish there was a little bit more to it. Gets me down to my number 22, which is Iron Man 3, and I think now I appreciate this film more and more every time I watch it. We have our Mandarin within Shang-Chi. Tony Leong did an amazing job in that. But Iron Man 3 for me is just one of those awesome delights. Shane Black came in here and literally made a Shane Black film with Robert Downey Jr. And I like how this movie, and I've always said it, is more about the man behind the Iron Mask than it is about the, the Iron Man itself. The villain is kind of a mess, not gonna lie. But this is just an entertaining movie that I don't have too many big words to say about it. But it's, it's a blast, and it's very different than most of the MCU. Wish they would have touched a little bit more on Tony's PTSD going forward, specifically that was established in here, but that's the growing pains of the MCU as well. Getting into my number 21 is Avengers Age of Ultron. This is a movie that, as many big issues as the film has structurally with its story and having to, oh yeah, while we have an Avengers story and a team-up film, we gotta flesh out these other storylines as well, so later in the future, you give a shit. That doesn't work all the time, but it's branches of what it's trying to do with Civil War works. What it's trying to do and set up into that, great. And it feels fluid and motion. But as well, what I love about this movie and what I actually love about some more of it than the original Avengers film is the fact that we just couldn't see the Avengers doing a mission right at the start of it. The, the start of this film is so awesome because you get that mission and then alongside that, it pushes you forward and you just get to see them hanging out at a party. You get to see the Avengers just having this great dynamic, and I think as much as I love them all meeting for the first time in the first Avengers, I can't deny that I think some of the best moments of the Avengers are all inside this movie because it's it's the one movie that I felt we actually just got to see them work 
together as a team. They've known each other for a while, for a full phase. And while we haven't seen it, we get to see it in this movie, and it's believable. There's honestly some days that I wish we would have had one more Avengers film before Civil War, or even Infinity War if possible, because it's elements like that that give that development more to each and every one of the characters, specifically when they're working, and I've always found that Thor works better when he's with the Avengers. I've always found it better when we get Mark Ruffalo, a little bit more of the Hulk and Bruce Banner in this world, and just seeing Steve Rogers, Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow, Jeremy Renner's Hawkeye, and even, of course, Tony Stark himself all interacting, it always makes it to be awesome. Well, I hope Ultron one day returns because he was epic in here. Now getting down into my number 20 is Spider-Man Homecoming. This is just that John Hughes coming of age story that I think a lot of us have always been interested in seeing within the Spider-Man world within live action. And that's exactly what's delivered here. It doesn't have gigantic stakes and it absolutely didn't need to. This is the closest that we've gone to Spider-Man just working in the street level of everything. And I think going forward, that's what we're going to see a little bit more of for a tiny bit. And I'm happy to see that because Vulture, is, and I'll say this, is one of my least favorite villains in the entire comic book series and gaming. I hate the character of the Vulture. This is my favorite interpretation of that. A lot of that is because of how great Michael Keaton is as in the role and the way that they intersected the Vulture into this. I thought he was a great villain. I think Tom Holland just continues to excel into the Spider-Man world, and I think Spider-Man Homecoming is an enjoyable film. Getting down to my number 19, though, is Doctor Strange. I think Doctor Strange is one of the coolest origin stories that we've gotten in the MCU, and I primarily don't really have any issues. Like, going here on up, I actually just have a blast with a lot of these movies, To I think they're either great great to excellent now and Doctor Strange is one of those ones that I just think is a damn great time the magic the mysticism it's all crafted in such a grand way and within that grand way though and that grando scale I've really loved to see what Benedict Cumberbatch has been able to do inside this role and the way that Scott Derrickson crafted the mysticism side of this and then bringing in Tilda Swinton to play the Ancient One, I just think brings so much added magic to this world. And I was very excited to see what Doctor Strange was able to deliver here in terms of an origin story to magic and mysticism in the MCU. The only slight big con of this is the fact that they just did not use Mattis Mickelson well. That guy deserved way better. I'm at number 18 is Ant-Man though, and Ant-Man for me is just a blast of a time. I'm a huge heist fan, I love heist movies, and that's exactly what Ant-Man is. I love Luis in here too, that was such a tragic thing that he was not in Quantumania, that they couldn't weave him into the story at all. Whatever. You don't want to include Michael Pena, you're messing out. That's why Ant-Man Quantumania is so low on this ranking, but uh, Ant-Man, Paul Rudd was just such a, a unique casting to play Scott Lang, but then when I found out that they were doing Hank Pym and Scott and Michael Douglas was going to be playing him, that added dynamic, their kind of weird father-son-in-law relationship just works, and I think what really works here is that Edgar Wright was clearly supposed to direct this first. Didn't work out because he wanted to do a lot of different things. The MCU had morphed at it this time to something else. And a lot of those added elements of what Edgar Wright wanted to do with the character, I think are still there. And I think those are the reasons that some of this movie really works so much better than the other two Ant-Man films is because Edgar Wright's charm is literally still crafted and weaved all over the script. This is just a film that I think exactly knew what needed to be. It needed to be Honey, I Shrunk the Kids in the MCU, adding in there and tying into a little bit more. It's its own thing for the most part. I find it to be awesome, and I find it to be fun. Oh, my number 17 is Black Widow. Now, th this movie, I'm not, I'm not shitting you. This would probably be in my top 10 if it wasn't for the third act. I think the third act is like such a giant disservice to the entire film itself. Not on thematically or emotional, but just in general, like, it, why did it have to go into the sky? Why did the CGI have to be all shit up there and take you out of the experience? Alongside that, if I'm worried, if I'm going to get a little bit more cons, I hated what they did with Taskmaster. I, I really love that character in the comics, and I just thought it was not great here. But, all that aside, I really love Black Widow. I love that this is kind of that story that we now have with the character, and I feel like it's a story that obviously should have came much, much sooner, but now knowing about her, knowing about her family, knowing you get the Red Guardian, I love him. I think David Arbor is incredible. I'm very sorry for my terrible Russian accent, but I love that. And Florence Pugh as Yelena is 
just excellent. These are characters. And then you want to look at like Rachel Weiss, who's also another character. I love Melina. These this family dynamic. That that's what I'm so excited for and I loved so much. And then you just get more development on on Scarlett Johansson. She gives an excellent performance as Black Widow, putting this right after Civil War. This is the film we should have had right after Civil War. This would have been the perfect little cleanser to give us more development. I think it would have been such an added impact. I love this movie and even with my issues towards the third act, this is a movie that I think two thirds of it are incredible. The other third, it's fine. I'm at number 16, probably the next controversial one on this list. I have about two more of these, so just be embraced. But at my number 16, Thor Love and Thunder. I know many people hate this movie. I I wish I could be on your same wavelength so I don't get shit on all the time. But I, just hear me out. I know that there's too much humor. I, I do know that. Just like Thor Ragnarok, too much humor sometimes in this. Same thing with the goats, those are annoying, and Gore the God Butcher absolutely should have done more God Butching. The reason this movie works for me though, the biggest, biggest reason is all because of the thematics. Thematically, what we are given here with Natalie Portman's Jane Foster coming back, getting the hammer, becoming Lady Thor as well, and her cancer storyline was handled so well, to me at least, and the way that it fleshes out their relationship, Thor himself, and what the film is being called Thor and why it's called Love and Thunder. The ending really made me just smile. And I think the greater overall thing, I always go back to two scenes of why this film works for me. It's the boat scene of Jane Foster and Thor talking, where they could have easily threw in a lot more jokes, and there's jokes in there to be said, but... It reminded me of the great writing of Jojo Rabbit. And then it's the scene, the final goodbye. Could have been a giant battle between Gore and Thor and Lady Thor, and it wasn't. There was a fun action scene with the kids, and it was goofy and silly, but that final sequence, when Gore decides to just wish for his daughter to come back instead of the death of all gods, honestly brought a tear to my eye. And then seeing Lady Thor die. And then, of course, when you do get to the end credit scene, you see Valhalla. These are elements that I love within this movie. And I think Thor Love and Thunder executes those very well. And for me, it, it's the reason that I do go back to this one the most. Element number 15, though, is The Avengers. This is a classic movie. I honestly mean that. It, when you look at cinema and history of cinema, this is the one out of the entire MCU that I will refrain and say, that is classic movie. That is a classic film that will be studied in, in school eventually to see how one studio was able to finally build up to this big event. And do I think the first Avengers is perfect? No, by any means. I know a lot of people actually have this a lot higher on their list. And typically, I actually have it a lot lower on my list because it's not one that I go back to too often now because I think it's kind of slow in the middle. Not going to lie. I think some of it drags a bit, but... All the exciting moments in the first and the third act are so good. I love the dynamic of the Avengers finally coming together. Alan Silvestri's store's score is great. And the whole new battle for New York is just everything that you would imagine as a comic book nerd. The Avengers was a success story and it still continues to be one today. I'm number 14 is Civil War. I freaking love Civil War. Even if I feel there should have been a little bit more stakes to it all. This is one that's actually continued to start growing on me once again. Um, I had a purpose in time where this used to be a lot lower too because I'd go, I went back and watched it and I just got like frustrated with like certain things of like, I feel like this character should have died. I feel like there should have been more stakes here and there, but in the overall grander purpose, Civil War is pretty badass. And I can't deny that, how awesome the movie is with its action sequences, with its, again, story very much of two brothers in a way, breaking up over one of their brothers' best friend killing his parents. And I think what it did for Infinity War and Endgame is the reason to really look at Civil War as a whole. Because if you don't have Civil War and if Civil War didn't work out, Infinity War wouldn't have worked out. And then Infin if in this didn't work out and you tried to make Infinity War, then Endgame and bringing back Tony and Steve back together once again, these little added nuances just wouldn't work. Civil War is like a pivotal moment entire inside the entire MCU, not just for Steve Rogers' character but for Tony Stark as well. And I think when I'm going back through and doing this ranking, a lot of it kind of leads to 
how does it make the overall grandeur of the MCU work and also character wise. The action everyone knows is all exceptional in this, but that's one of the most important parts now and it's great. On my number 13 is Spider-Man Far From Home, which is another film I know some of you guys have way lower on your list. I get it. For me, I, I'm totally biased. You've probably seen in the background. I have Mysterio. Mysterio for me is my favorite Spider-Man villain of all time. So this is a big reason of why Mysterio and the reason that this film is honestly higher up. It, it's one of my few biased picks on here because of how much of a fan I am and how much of a fan I am of how John Watts infused those action scenes. I still think there's some of my favorite set pieces in the entire MCU. But the other thing I love about this is I hated the idea of Spider-Man man not being in new york city i despise that idea i thought that was a stupid idea and i still think there are some stupid added nuances to this entire film but to the overall character of peter parker it works to bring in mysterio someone who clearly is kind of like supposed to be the iron man role to him that mentor i like that but i also like how this kind of shifted back and said no like, Spider-Man does not need that. Spider-Man can be its own person. By the end of the film, by the third act fight scene, you feel that, that he is adding Spider-Man. Whether he's morphing and doing little things together to do all those little elements. And I also like the added development of how they fleshed out more of him and MJ in this. I thought Zendaya and Tom Holland have an excellent relationship and chemistry to this. And I mean, look at it. It's even real in real life. So, I, I loved this movie i still have a blast with it there's some cringy moments to it i'm not gonna deny that but this is still one of my favorite spider-man films of all time for a reason i mean to my number 12 i think this is my last big uh holy shit why is this a so high on his mcu ranking and that's eternals uh i don't know what it is I fucking love this movie. I love this movie so much. I love each and every one of the characters. I love each and every one of their dynamics. I love what this flushes out for the MCU. I want more of the Eternals. I like how big of a breath of fresh air it is. I also like how it feels like a DC film. And maybe that's why, because I'm a big, I'm a big fan of some of the DCU stuff, but I'm also a big fan of just Chloe Zhao as a director and how she very much made a unique and different movie in the MCU. And I can understand some of the frustrations with certain plot points and in general the overall scale of the mcu because i do think there's a lot of stuff they need to touch on within this but when it overall comes to this family and their dynamics the betrayals the reasonings for what they have been doing over the last century and how they have been a pivotal part of all of the mcu and just in general history for us I think is eye-opening and i think eternals is a brilliant movie that will only continue to find an audience i think again i thought the action scenes were just incredible uh makari the f speed dynamic i mean you i've seen speedsters in so many things before makari is still the coolest speed stuff that i've seen and the whole fight scene i like how the villain of this like the, the they tried to make these villains the deviants, which were kind of wasted, but it ended up being one of them. And in a way, they were actually the villains of the entire story. Uh, I just cannot believe how brilliant this movie was to me and how much I love it. And I'm flabbergasted by still just like the reception of it initially. I love Eternals. It is messy at times. I will I will not deny that, but it's a movie that I love going back to and rewatching, and I hope to see more of these characters eventually. Now we're at my number 11, which is Wakanda Forever, and I think Wakanda Forever is a great epilogue and continuation of the Black Panther legacy, and while I wish we would have gotten Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa going up against Namor, we didn't. So they had a lot of added elements to really infuse in here, and I think Ryan Coogler as a director did a great job. He gave us a grieving story that familiar works for it all then brought in namor introduced all of talocon which was just exceptional and i loved the dynamic of all that but then you also not just talocon and namor himself but what you're also adding into here into the world of wakanda is a new black panther and while i like the choice of shuri getting it I'm not completely blown away by it. I actually would have liked if like Lupita Nyong'o's character had had it throughout most of the movie or even Angela Bassett. That would have been fucking badass. But this is a film that I think if you've ever grieved someone, this is something that does add to that added development of it all. It just brings more of what we wanted from the original Black Panther, furthers out the legacy of this all, 
and I can't wait to see when we get to go back to Wakanda once again. Is that my number 10? It's Black Panther. I think this is one of the coolest origin films in the entire MCU universe. The style, the flair, Ryan Coogler, and of course the characters specifically Michael B. Jordan's Killmonger, who I think is still one of the best villains in the MCU. His dynamic with Chadwick Boseman, all working in excellent flair. All the characters they introduce here, it, this is just such a big, bombastic film that means so much to the MCU and also means so much to film history as a whole because of the African-American culture coming into the comic book realm. And at this point, the only hero that we had ever really had with that is Blade. And Blade was like a cult classic into that sense. I love of Wesley Snipes Blade, but there was just this difference with this movie. And I just really found that they just nailed exactly what they needed to do in this. It gave me so much happiness, it gave me so much heart, and at the same time it infused and brought in a new world that I was never really familiar with within the comic books. I always saw Black Panther show up, I always thought he was badass, but I was never familiar with Wakanda itself. And Wakanda introduced one of the best aspects of the MCU yet within its world, and I just love it so much. Um, number nine is Shang-Chi, which is like, where is this guy in the MCU? Like, how has it been this long since we've seen him again because of how big of a standout Simu Liu was as the character we need more shang chi right now i'm telling you please not just because the action scenes but because of the world the dragon at the end tony leong is mandarin just such a great father-son story there then even adding in his dynamic with his sister was quite awesome aquafina was actually surprisingly good in here as well i fucking love shang chi i think shang chi is so badass i just love it i love it and a lot of it is just because of every added element to it all so Please give me more Shang-Chi eventually. I would get into my number eight though, and that's Iron Man. This is the kickoff of the entire MCU. And there's not a lot more that I can say to this that I haven't said in all my other rankings and what other people have said in theirs who have this as high too. It feels like such a different era of blockbuster style, but it just works for its manners as an introduction to the MCU as a whole and as it really works because of Robert Downey Jr's infectious love for the characters and his infectious performance. It's an easily rewatchable movie that you can just jump into at any point in time and honestly have a complete blast rewatching. I love Iron Man. I love the graphics. I love the visual effects. I love this origin story. For me this still remains to be the best origin story for a singular character in the MCU. So, I love Iron Man. Now we're at my number seven, which is Captain America the Winter Soldier. And, I mean, what else is there to say? Uh, I can go on about the action. I can go on about how great of a character bro broker it is for Steve Rogers. But I really love in this how it's just him, uh, Falcon, and then uh, Black Widow really working in harmony, thinking Nick Fury's dead and having to work alongside that. But when it comes to the reveal that Bucky is the Winter Soldier, it's such a big moment and a pivotal moment in his life that from there, I felt like the film was just boom. And I think the added bonus of this movie is the fact that it does feel more of a political thriller than anything else. I'm always constantly on edge watching this movie even though i know how it's going to end at this point i just never know how it's going to go I'm hoping that the first anthony mackie captain america movie can really deliver those same goods in that political nature that nuance that makes you stressed out the entire time watching it but at my number six now is Avengers Endgame. And for me, this is just the definitive conclusion to the Infinity Saga. You have such grand flair and love inside of this all. And it just is the culmination of all these films that we've previously talked about all coming into one. And it's great to see characters like Rocket Raccoon and Nebula working with some of the Avengers that are still alive, mostly the main Avengers. It's great to see where Hawkeye ended up going after losing his family. But what I love is how this film is broken up in the three acts. The first act is very much an epilogue to the conclusion of Infinity War. The second act is very much, how are we going to fix this? Let's do it. Okay, we fixed it. The third act is that grand endgame battle that we wanted. Thanos, his army, versus every freaking hero that we've seen. And it's pure orgasmic to any geek and comic book nerd in that moment because the action is top-notch 
The battle is incredible. It has its stakes, and the entire film itself is just top tier. I love Endgame. There's some smaller nuances that I have little issues with, but this is one of the, the most rewatchable movies of all time. This brings me down to my number five, which is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now, if you've watched previous videos, this used to be a lot lower until Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which really made this whole thing full circle, this entire trilogy. And it actually made me appreciate more Volume 2. I've always really liked it and enjoyed it, but from what we get to learn in Volume 3, there's so much things that adds to the nuance of Volume 2 that makes it feel that the top, that the three Guardians of the Galaxy films have to be in the top five of my MCU ranking because of how much I love that trilogy and because of how much added development it does for it. Volume 2 is awesome. You get great nuance from the first thing, more development for each character, and I like how the film actually doesn't have a lot of action. It really is just focusing in on all the characters, even though they're all separated. But now, as much as I didn't like that the first time I watched it, now seeing how Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 works... It actually makes sense for all these characters together. So I love Volume 2, and it's really only grown on me in recency. So take that as for what you will. Now my number four is Spider-Man No Way Home. Spider-Man No Way Home is just the celebration of all live-action Spider-Mans. That's the best way that I can view this. And as someone who has grown up, my first drive-in movie I ever saw was the Tobey Maguire original Spider-Man movie. And then one of the biggest parts of my high school life was going to see the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movie in theaters. And then being completely excited when Spider-Man was showing up in the MCU. So for me, I have this perfect balance of having all three Spider-Man be someone that I've grown up with in different parts of my life. My child life, my teenage life, and my adult life. And it's very unique to see all these different elements and then revisit the films and garner new appreciation for each and every one of them. And then get to go see No Way Home and be absolutely celebrated by not just a fun story with Tom Holland trying to figure out how to be Spider-Man on his own, but as at the same time feeling like he's alone. And then finding out that there's other Spider-People out there. And then you have to deal with the villains on all top of this. It, it just works in grand harmony. And I think a lot of the reason this film works is because of the ending with the two other two Spider-Men. And I think the added development that they get with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are just irresistible. As Spider-Man being my favorite superhero of all time, this is the movie that I needed so much. Which brings me into my number three, which is the Avengers Infinity War. This was just the two towers of the MCU. All these different teams having to fight off Thanos and stop him when in reality they should have joined together, which they do in Endgame and they finally get to stop him, but it's just so grandose. I loved how they did the pacing of this movie. It flies by. There doesn't seem to be a lot of story in here, and reality is I don't think there really needed to be. It is just full-on bonkers action. We need to stop Thanos and it's the culmination of everything. You actually get to see all these characters interacting. And the smartest thing was developing who was going to be with who, which team members would be with what. And getting all those moments was such a blast. I mean, everything on Titans for me is still like top tier MCU. Some of my favorite stuff. The Guardians, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, Spider-Man. Count me in. I will watch that all day long. I love this movie. Number two now, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. As I mentioned, Iron Man, I think, is still the best singular origin story for a superhero in the MCU, but when it comes down to an overall team and establishing multiple characters in here, I think it's hard to deny that James Gunn didn't deliver something great, and something that honestly shouldn't have worked, but the fact that he was able to give development to every character in the Guardians of the Galaxy within the first film works in star-studded style. You instantly love Peter Quill Star Lord. You instantly fall for Dave Batista's Drax. And same thing with Gamora. Rocket and Groot are irresistibly great characters that you just can't get enough of. For me, this is what we needed. And I was so happy when this was announced because Guardians of the Galaxy was one of my favorite comic books. I loved a lot of these characters. I was very excited for this movie. And then the movie came out and it was just freaking great. It was a delight opening up the cosmic universe and getting a little bit more of that into the mcu it's 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 so great i can't believe this film works and a lot of it is so great and it was my number one mcu film for the longest time till my number one which is still my favorite 
MCU film since earlier this year, and I think it'll be quite a while before it's ever surpassed again, and that is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I think this isn't just one of the best comic book films of all time. I think as of right now that Guardians of the Galaxy is the best comic book trilogy of all time. Now, I'll wait till Spider-Verse because now we're two for two on that one too, but the way that James Gunn wrote this entire story culminates into Volume 3 in a great way. Rocket being one of the main characters in here, getting development for him, great. Added conclusion to everything else, Star-Lord and Gamora, great. And I didn't think it would be. I was not happy that they were going to continue with this with, not, with Gamora not being on the team. But everything made sense. And the ending of this movie, that dance. There's something about the ending of this movie, which is one of my favorite, not just MCU moments, but honestly one of my favorite movie moments in all of history, is because of what it means for these characters. The culmination of a perfect song with a perfect dance, with a perfect ending, with a perfect goodbye to these characters. And where everyone left on their own terms, no one died. No one had to die. Gamora got the family she's always wanted. Nebula became the leader of a world that needed help. Drax, in a sense, became a dad. Mantis went off on her own. I'm sure we'll see her eventually. Star-Lord went back to Earth. And Rocket and Groot took over the Guardians. And as a perfect rep representation of this team that's exactly what it is i'm trying not to get emotional talking about this damn movie because it's so freaking painful at times but i love volume 3 so much and it is my favorite mcu film of all time so thank you guys so much for watching this i really do appreciate you guys i had a blast talking with the mcu look forward to that tv ranking coming out hopefully tomorrow after this video premieres but maybe a couple days afterwards we got a lot coming up this weekend but thank you so much again for watching and of course until next time stay class